At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Mark Creditor, MPM, founded Get There First Realty, Inc. in 1981 and serves as its president. Mr. Creditor has been vice president of NA NRT LLC since August 2014. He served as his president of the National Association of Residential Property Managers, NARPM. He is widely recognized as among the four, foremost national authorities on single family property management. He was a founding member of the Blue Book, a residential uh, listing guide published in Dallas and served as chairman of the property management leasing committee of the Dallas Association of Realtors. He has taught real estate investment strategy at Southern Methodist University's continuing education program and has presented his real estate workshops to investors and property managers nationwide. He also has traveled extensively on behalf of the National Association of Residential Property Managers and has been a guest speaker at every convention since 1992. He is certified as a national instructor for NARPM in marketing and office operations and in 2002 was awarded the nation's highest honor, NARPM's President's Award. He holds an MPM, Master of Property Management, designation from NARPM, which is held by fewer than 100 managers nationally. Whew, that is a lot of capital letter initials behind your name. <laughs> Please help me give a warm welcome to Mark Creditor. Thank you. So we want to be sure our AV works first, so let me do that, and then I will be good to go. We are almost good. Let me just get the mouse done and we're good. We're good, okay. So my topic today is to not sell like you buy. And this came about because I'm going to be 60 years old in a few weeks. And I recognized as I was in business for 30 years that I was working with people from other generations. I was working for people from other generations. I was having people fix my rental properties on behalf of my owners who are from different generations. And I realized in everything we do in life, we can't sell like we buy. That we have to be aware and in many ways have empathy on how other people need to be transacted with. And I think this is very important. You can't fit everybody in a box. And a lot of what I talk about is why this box is really the key to success. Um, if, can we lower any lights in the front so that we can see this better? Thank you. The purpose of Bob Dylan's radical song in the 60s of these times are changing was to really let us know that change is inevitable and change always occurs and much of what I talk about today will have to do with the changes in the marketplace that we see in property management. Because real estate, it really is much more uh, about our clients and our customers in their present state but how we evolve and we move with market shifts because you cannot remain the same. I admire companies that have children that can take over the business because you naturally live with this generational change. But if you are a sole practitioner as I was, it makes it very difficult. And in a nutshell, I had 1,600 properties when I sold the business uh, four and a half, four years ago to uh, NRT, which owns the brands of Colwell Banker, and subsequently retired. But what I recognized most was I was the only listing agent and everything that I did was based on a person who was born in 1958. And it wasn't until I embraced these millennials that we went to some software platforms and some very innovative things that though I didn't understand was the only way that I was going to be able to have millennial clients because I was very focused on people that were my age or older. And I, and I just kind of gave it up and I gave it to them and it, and it really saved me. It helped business. So property management must always be competing at much more sophisticated levels, especially here in Texas and always in Austin, Texas, because I, I said to a, a colleague this morning that Austin was always ahead of the curve on how much trouble can a property manager get in. So in Austin, if you could be a great property manager here, you would be really good in Dallas because we don't have as many people looking over our shoulder. 
it's much like the concept of playing basketball with two players and 10 referees. A quote that was given to me when I spoke uh, in California, but now it's here in Texas. You are being watched in everything you do, from housing and urban development to the city inspectors to the real estate commission. We are constantly looking for a bear trap to step in. You have to be on your best game in every aspect of your business. That is number one. Don't waste time on things that don't produce revenue because you'll figure out quite soon that it's all about revenue. It's all about how we can net the most. And part of this self-analysis that I ask you to do with me this morning has to do with really taking your brain and doing C colon erase star dot star. Like just really come to this with an open mind to look at what is it about ourselves, our inner brand, that we can leverage in the relationships we have as property managers so that we can profit the most. And to do this, you have to first reinvent yourself and begin to think about how we're perceived in the marketplace. This is how most people look at what does a property manager do for a living. We tear the heart out of our clients, our customers, we beat up our vendors, and we certainly aren't kind to our employees. This was my life for 30 years. <laughs> And I found that I was really not as awful as people made us out to be. And when Yelp came on, I really needed to seek professional counseling because I could not believe all of the Joe Pesci movies I was being compared to in what I did for a living. Literally, if you Google me in Yelp, you will see me compared to Joe Pesci in most movies where he killed people. <laughs> this was what I brought home to the kids. And then you would tell an owner's coming to town and we were going to have an inspection. And the tenant would say, don't worry, you'll be able to find the unit, and they would spray paint bad landlord. So you have so much challenge in your life. I empathize. I know what it's like to be a property manager, and I want you to try today to look at the bright side, the things that we can begin to do to leverage the most amount of profit we can make, because all of you Every one of you is underpaid. Every one of you should not have to put up with what you put up with for the money you make. This is a highly undercompensated industry for what it does to people because it is very difficult to be a property manager long term. You deal with the consumer in their worst way. You often deal with owners, especially in a market like ours where people are paying a lot, they're leveraging a lot, and they may lose a lot. You're constantly getting yelled at. I used to use the analogy, I was the referee of the boxing match. In this corner was the tenant who was beating me up constantly because I wasn't fixing things the right way. And the owner was beating us up because we were spending too much on repairs. So basically, both people just beat up the referee all day long. That's being a property manager. But let's look at some of the conventional ways with which we make revenue. Property management fees. Property management fees Either you charge a percentage of what you're uh, taking in or a flat fee. Nobody here is going to talk about fees. We should have that clear right off the bat. And if you have any questions when I have a slide up, just raise your hand. It's no problem to interrupt. But when we look at property management fees, and I say here, just cover the company bills. Because property management fees, in many ways, is the least profitable fee you charge because it requires the most amount of manpower, woman power, labor. And I started to look at all of the fee centers that were available to me, and I wanted to really focus and invest on the ones that required the least amount of labor. And property management always came out at the bottom of the list. I have to talk to somebody. So it started almost with that relationship is the most expensive. You have to pay people to talk to other people. Therefore, property management fees, if you really run your business as I did, like a giant Cuisinart, you really need to focus on the fact that you need other things to help build the brand. Application fees. This is a very likely fee that most of us are charging. And as we all know, you can't really keep it unless you give written instructions to the resident of what it takes to qualify. Those written requirements need to be posted everywhere up front. 
but we would always, as a rule, charge application fees for everybody over 18. And I would get an argument that would say, but we're married. And I'd say, yeah, but this couple over here, they've been living together for 20 years. You've been married since Tuesday night in Vegas, but they want a discount on an app fee. So we just made rules that were real simple. Everybody over 18 pays an application fee. And then we would start to get those mortgage letters that people wanted us to fill out and take time from our day. Well, there's a fee to fill out anything in writing for an application verification uh, in writing, especially to a mortgage company. The tenants would often say, that's, that's ridiculous. Why should I have to pay for you to fill that out? I said, I have a great option. Don't buy the house. Renew the lease. I was never very funny with my tenants. <laughs> Leasing fees. Uh, perhaps markets bear this or don't, but whether or not you charge a flat leasing fee or a percentage of leasing fees. But one of the things that I was so uh, focused on in terms of finding a profit center was buying marketing in bulk. Like the, the, they said in my introductions that I founded the Blue Book. Well, the Blue Book was a residential listing service. So if I founded it and I was an investor in it, I'd be able to then sell ads to my owners for less than they would pay themselves. So they were saving money, but I was buying in bulk. There are many online advertising products. Obviously, I know the market is very tight. You don't even advertise rentals, but in my world, wherever I would find an opportunity to save my owners money by buying in bulk and then selling it to them at a discount, still making a profit, it was, it was a no-brainer. There were many online services that would charge an owner $80 to run an ad. If I bought in bulk, I could pay $16, charge my owner $49, and advertise the fact that I'm saving owners money in marketing their rentals, still making that spread. I looked at my business like I was Home Depot and I, I looked at how I can be off price and still make profit. Renewal fees. Do we charge a percentage of the renewal or do we charge a flat fee? For many, many years I charged the flat fee and when rent started to go up I felt so foolish it should have been a percentage. If, if rents you believe are always going to be in a upward trend long term, your whole life should be based on the percentage of that appreciation so that you're partnering in getting these higher rents. We also had referral fees when tenants would buy a property or when we would l give a property for a listing. Uh, how many of you in-house sell real estate as well as manage? So it's less than half the room. So the rest of us need relationships to move real estate that has to be sold. And having those fee relationships uh, embedded in the best service for your clients, your owners, or your customers, your tenants, should produce referral fees. This is a robust part of real estate. You just have to find the right partners to take good care of your owner clients and your tenant customers. Uh, preferred vendor fees. Uh, this was probably the single most, uh, second most profitable area of our business. The single most profitable was bounce checks. But the second most profitable was factoring receivables for vendors. And I believe that money management or money fees requires the least amount of labor. So if my vendor fixes an air conditioner for $1,000 on a second of the month, he can either get paid on the first of the following month when I get the money from the owner, or we'll factor the receivable in advance the same day that he brings us the invoice for a smaller percentage of the total. This is done very commonly with retail manufacturers, people who make clothes that are small businesses for a retailer like Macy's. Well, I make a bunch of shirts and I sell it to Macy's. I'm going to wait 90 to 120 days to get paid. I need to pay my staff. So I find a third party factor that would pay me a percentage of my receivable to Macy's cash. I found every vendor loved it. They used to call me the slot machine. And if Johnny the plumber needed to buy a truck, he could go pay 27% at the used car lot, or he could just always get uh, a line of credit from us for a fraction of that. It was just the relationship we had with our vendors. We were their banks. And factoring the receivables that they have owed by owners, which we would pay from proceeds coming the following month's rent, was universally accepted, and they were happy to pay a small percentage. The rule was, though, and I was very clear with my owners in disclosing this relationship, they had to charge the owner less money for the initial repair than they would charge any other person, any other management company. So again, win-win. The owners were paying less for the repair, 
they were getting funded quickly on the receivable and I was making that factoring fee. Anybody have any questions about that program? That was a very, very easy thing to do with our vendor relationships. Yes, ma'am. How did I factor it? No, I did it just like the Macy's shirt example. If I fix the air conditioner for $1,000 and he wants his money today, so I would give him 900 for the invoice today. Just depends on how fast he wanted the money. No problem. So the, the most important factor is you disclose everything to your owner and the way you sell it to your owner that it makes sense is if by using preferred vendors, we're going to give them a lot of business. Johnny the plumber did all of our plumbing. But if you went to Johnny the plumber out of the available pages, he was $109.95 to come to your house and unstop your toilet. He charged our owners $69.95, maybe even less than that on a good day. So my owners were immediately saving up to 40% from Johnny the plumber or Peter the air conditioner or, you know, Mike the tree trimmer. So we had to have these relationships in writing with the vendor that they were going to charge our owners less than they would charge the owner without us or you as another property management company. That's the first win. The second win was if the vendor wanted to be paid today instead of waiting for me to pay my bills when I get rents, then they could just bring the receivable over to the slot machine and we would put it through and pay, you know, a percentage of the invoice. Since 90 is the example I used. So that you, so that you discount on cost of return. Correct. Yeah, there's a lot of profit in vendors who charge $109.95 to stop out a toilet. Again, I, I, the answer is no, because you'll get more customers if you save money to your owners. So you start with, with it's small, and again, I use this Cuisinart. You just put everything in the Cuisinart. It comes out the same consistency, and I think you'll find most owners will run to you if you can save them money because you have better relationships with vendors. Uh, tax appraisal petitioning must be a huge business. It is so big in Dallas that I get a bill for my appraised value of my house and it's ridiculous. Well, I would contract with this person who would do all of the rental properties for our owners and he would charge my owners instead of a half of the first year's savings, he would charge them a third. That was a big savings for our owners uh, from a half to a third of, of his fee. But he would only do it for our owners. But then again, I would pay him and, and factor the receivables. So we would get a, f a check from that as well, fully disclosed to the owners. The key is to always be negotiating on behalf of your owners as your primary fiduciary responsibility is to the client. The second part is how you do business with your vendors in their cash flow needs, their borrowing needs. And many times they are the, they're going to have to charge you more if they pay 27% interest for a new truck. If I lend them the money for the truck and they pay 10%, I'm making 10% of my money, but they're also able to charge my owners less money because their truck costs them less. Those are the relationships that you want to have in all aspects of their life. As I said earlier, the number one profit center of our business was bounce checks. Um, bounce checks are probably the easiest things to collect. I assume you can get a warrant in Austin if you give them a 10-day notice in writing that they bounce the check. Everybody's going to make up the check. But we funded our owners. We funded our owners the same day we received rents. So the owner never even knew the check bounced. So this is all upside to us. We would collect almost all the bounce checks pretty easily. And it was a gravy train every 10th to 15th of the month. If we got 20 or 30 bounce checks, we would be able to make 100 or $200, whatever it is. Uh, that was a reasonable estimate of our uncertain damages. Um, and then, of course, we had late fees, which, as I said, quickly mumbled under my breath, and I'll say it clearly must be a reasonable estimate of the owner's uncertain damages. That's right out of property code that changed uh, 10 years ago. So you cannot charge $100 a day on a $400 rental. It must be a reasonable estimate. And we went to much lower late fees after this came in. So it was much more um, user friendly for the tenant who needed to pay late, which is a choice they make. Eviction protection fees. This is another fee that uh, works very well with owners. We 
often file evictions and it's a very expensive process that owners are dealing with. So for a fee each year, our owners would be covered that if we had to go to court, we would pay the fees on their behalf, part of this pool of money that the owners would um, put in themselves. Um, and it is almost like if an owner has to go to court and I have to pay the fees, it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars and some tenants are chronically being filed on. For one fee up front, the owner would be part of this pool and it would all be paid for by um, the property management company's eviction protection pool. This I learned about in California about 20 years ago and I think it, when I sold the business we had about 92 percent of our owners compliant with it and it also empowered the owners to file much faster earlier in the month because they didn't care it wasn't their money it was being paid by the, the super fund. But it all worked out great because most tenants cure the eviction so they would pay it back but it's the risk we took and it's all about taking calculated risks that you know you're not going to lose on the basis of any business. This is huge. I mean, when we, when we sold the company, um, I think I had almost $3 million invested with security deposits. So you have a security deposit, you have a growing business. I bet you in this room there's probably $100 million of security deposit monies. You need to have that money working for you every single day of every year. There's no reason why you don't keep that money in interest-bearing accounts. The rule is as long as you take out that interest so it doesn't compound like every 30 days or however your accounts are, you can have that par value. If you took $100,000 of your security deposits and you bought a bond, at par that paid twice a year, as long as you take that money out twice a year and you don't allow it to compound on the 100000 you're in compliance. And the most important thing is you have to have the money available whenever the tenant gives notice 30 days after they give you their um, forwarding address in writing for an itemization. But we have growing businesses. We probably never even touch today's security deposits because tomorrow we're getting new tenants. And I knew that I was able to grow the business and there wouldn't be a call on cash. So I would invest 95% of our security deposits. And I checked rates today because I always like to kind of tell you that you could easily get 25 to 3% on a, on a one year money market or CD. Uh, if you go out longer, you can probably get 4%. Um, my favorite investment that I bought almost all of our um, security deposits was the State of Israel bonds. They're AAA rated, they pay twice a year, and they're uh, the most reliable, um, non-normal, like CD type product. I did buy some CDs, but I, I really felt that I could go longer out uh, on bonds, and those made me uh, uh, twice a year I would get paid. But this is real revenue. You're, you're sitting on a lot of cash. You need to have that cash working for you every day of the month. This is what people do in real businesses. I have a friend, his job is when UPS closes in Atlanta until the next morning, he takes all the cash that they have and he goes and he invests all over the world in money uh, transactions. So when they wake up the next morning, UPS has made money. Most businesses have a cash program and every property manager needs to not have idle cash that you don't need until the tenant moves out sitting there without getting some type of a return. You're able to do it in Texas as long as you don't compound the money and obviously you pull the money out and you have the money always available for when the tenant moves out. Anybody have any questions on security deposits? Yes, sir. Five percent. A business always grew. I mean, I was always getting in new business, so I never needed today's money until that tenant moved out in a year. So I had a money market account, an interest-bearing money market account that I would keep five percent of our security deposits in, and I would always have that money available for this month's move-outs. But at the same time, I would never let that balance get over a certain amount that I know I never would need, and all the other monies I would take in groups of I don't know, whatever you want, 10,000, 100,000, a million, and buy these uh, longer term 
uh, bonds or CDs, whatever you're comfortable with, and you get a check, don't compound it, that part becomes illegal. Like your question was, how much? No, the five percent I would keep available to give security deposits back each month to tenants. You have to have some working capital for it. But if your business is growing, you, you'll never, you'll always be taking in more than you're spending. So it was never a problem. It was never a problem. I never needed to break a CD to pay a security deposit. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I'm only teaching in Austin today. Uh, no, you can't do it in all states. Most states require you to pay a, an interest rate to the tenants. So in most states, it's the opposite rule where you have to pay interest to tenants for having their security deposits. So you would never put in an interest bearing. You would just tell the tenant there was no interest. My children lived in Boston for many years and they were required to get their deposit plus 2%. I don't know what the owner did with the money, but he was losing 2% if he didn't do something with it. Um, my favorite story was the state of um, Minnesota. Dave Holt, a past president of uh, uh, NARPA, and I pointed to Ebert's because they were probably with me in Houston, Texas, 1989 for a convention. And he stood in front of the room and he said, the state of Minnesota requires me to pay 5% interest on security deposits. This is 1989. Interest rates were different. And the legislature only met like every six years. So in those six years, interest rates had gone to like 2%. So it was impossible for my friend to not lose 3% on the money. He put it in at two and he had to pay the 10 and five. But it didn't say that he couldn't invest the money. So the story that I like to tell is that he took all his security deposits and he invested it in a mutual fund and made more money with that investment than anything else. You cannot do that in Texas because you can't compound your profit or loss. So that's why it's much safer to just use CDs or instruments like that. Be conservative. Yes, sir. To pay the, um, to take the interest out every 30 days? No, no. Again, Israel bonds pay twice a year. So I did those because it was just twice oh, a year. I had it. But yes, 30 days. You would do it with a normal well, money market. Well, I'm kind of confused then. Bear with me. Um, so if the bonds pay twice a year, you only pull out you get sent a check. What? You get sent a check. Oh, you get sent a check. And that's in compliance. Though. I thought it was, oh, so it's not compounded. Correct. Because it's par. I understand. Yeah. And, and a CD works the same way. Very often with a CD, you put 10000 into the CD. It's not until a CD matures that you get your $10,100. As long as you pull the 100 out, you're in compliance. The state of Texas just says you can't compound. You've got to take it out within 30 days so that you're not buying mutual funds at Vanguard and just seeing this uh, compound upon itself. It's a real good area. Most of us are sitting on big deposits. You can certainly set up escrow accounts, naming an escrow account as you invest this money with your bank. It could be an interest bearing escrow account. Yeah. I mean, how it's named is not as important to me. So that would limit you to a, a normal conventional bank, which, I mean, every day the rates are in the paper. I use bankrate.com uh, to see what the best rate is, and that's what I would pick, and it is uh, insured. So that's great. So that would be <coughs> like Correct. No more Israel bonds. The, no, they're not guaranteed. But I did this before the 10-year rule started, just for the record. <laughs> okay, early termination fees and sublet fees. Paragraph 26 of our TAR lease has two columns. One allows the tenant to pay a fee if they were to bring you a replacement resident that you processed, and one had them pay you a fee if you were to find uh, a tenant to replace. But stepping back from that for a moment in a very strong rental market as we have all experienced in Texas, I say to my owners, we want you to get 12 months of rent. But in the event the tenant needs to early terminate, the tenant is going to pay three months rent. 
and you'll get all three months rent or 12, whichever is less. So you understand what could happen is the tenant is going to pay a three month early termination fee or a two month early termination fee. My owner is just interested in 12 months of rent. But if I have to release it and do all the paperwork and really do a lot of work to process a new tenant, I should be compensated for that. So I would say to my owners, you'll get 12 months of rent, which might include this penalty the tenant pays or not. Because if I lease it in one day, I've done the work. I've paid the commission. I've done the lease. Why should my owner get the upside? He or she is interested in 12 months of rent. So using these early termination fees, especially in a strong market where a tenant could get out of a lease at any time by paying two or three months, whatever you want it to be, uh, whatever the market bears, um, gives you another opportunity to be compensated for your time to replace the resident, which only makes sense because the owner would have paid that fee anyway. But sometimes in a strong market, there could be a, a waiting list just waiting to move in and the tenant will pay that to get out. That's option two. Option one is to just use paragraph 26 and allow the tenant to have those fees clearly stated if they found the replacement resident, which we would do because we didn't want to really be um, with our backs to the wall to find a tenant to replace our tenant. Now, of course, the market is very strong and you may really literally be able to lease something overnight. Think through this as to how this could be another fee opportunity for you for the time it takes you to process another tenant there should be some compensation to the property manager for turning the tenant. You're doing an inspection, one more than you had budgeted for, deposit itemization, one more than you had thought you'd have to do. So don't just let this be money that doesn't go to you. We dealt with homeowners associations all the time. Tenants would not follow instructions. They park in the wrong spot. They did some incredible things decorated the outside of the doors with spray paint. And the, the, the HOAs were really hard on us. You know, when most of you probably manage condominiums. You know, when you manage a condo, you're really working with three people. You have a tenant, you have an owner, and you have a homeowners association. Sometimes the homeowners association is the one that you really get the least respect from. I hate to say it. You're shaking your heads. You know, we were the only company in Texas that ever had a homeowners association put in their bylaws we could never manage there again. <laughs> because we wouldn't take the treatment that they, they gave us. They were so ugly about, you know, our tenants and this and that. And they just were, they just were being prejudiced because they didn't like our tenants and I just wouldn't put up with it and I called them on it. So they took care of that really fast at their next homeowners association meeting. I'm very proud of that, by the way. But when I have to deal with homeowners association and a tenant has incurred a fee, they parked in the wrong place and someone got towed or they decorated something wrong or they didn't mow a common area. In your lease, there really could be a fee that you're charging the tenant for this time it's taking you to deal with the homeowners association because that time needs to be compensated. It's outside of the normal scope of property management. And homeowners associations have huge expectations. I used to love when they would tell me, well, you need to drive over there and take a picture that it's now uh, fixed and send it to me or there's another uh, $20 a day that's going to be charged. So, I mean, I had nothing. I, I mean, I had to go do it and it could be an hour's drive. You know, it, it was it was really like managing a third entity. I had a tenant, I had an owner, and I had a homeowners association. So if the tenant is incurring these fees because of things they're not complying with, and of course I've provided them a copy of the homeowners association documents, please consider being compensated in some way as a fee because it's, it's outside the box. Anybody deal with homeowners associations? You're laughing, meaning it's not a fun experience. Yeah. The eviction processing. How many of you have ever been to eviction court? Okay, well, let me tell you what eviction court is like in my life. I would have to take a toll road, so I incurred a, a fee. I had to park in a parking garage next to the courthouse and pay for parking. That incurred a fee, and the judge was often late for the bench hearing, so I would lose a half a day of work. That, too, should be a fee. I didn't want to be there. The tenant chose for me to be there. They made a conscious choice not to pay the rent. So I would put in my lease 
a witness appearance fee or whatever you want to call it, but if I had to drive to court, pay the toll, park the car, spend a half a day, I should be compensated and so should you be compensated. It is a choice for a tenant to have to make you go to eviction court. So would you ever build out the property? No. I work for the owner. So personally, no, I, I never build anything to the owners. I work tirelessly for the owners. If the tenant did this and they wouldn't pay me because they didn't show up to court and skipped, I think that's kind of like an owner would say, you know, you're really not working for me. I would think this is part of the normal scope of management. I think this is part of the normal scope of management to go to court on behalf of a, an owner. But to charge a tenant because I'm having to do it to compensate me, I think that is not in the normal course of management. That's just my opinion. You could charge your owners. It all depends on how your management fee is structured. You know, it's, it's whether it's this bare bones, you know, I could just use the example of WOW Airlines or something like a uh, spirit where you're paying for everything on the flight, including your carry-on, that's your model, so you would charge them for it. If my model is the Air Emirates take a shower in first class property management company, I wouldn't charge my owners. And we were the Air Emirates take a shower in first class property management company. Real estate sales commissions, huge fee. Most of you, all of you have real estate licenses. If there's going to be a commission on a sale, this is a fee center that you should have built into your management agreement. And most of you using the TAR management agreement that do some brokerage probably have in there that the tenant buys the house, there might be a commission paid to you or otherwise. So these are normal things you just want to be aware of and not miss in negotiating the management structure of your agreements. Credit card process processing fees. Um, though this has to be structured in a certain way, we would give a cash discount in writing the lease so that if they used cash, which could be a check, a money order, or an ACH payment on our portal, then their rent would be $1,000. But if they didn't use any of those check boxes, which I think are on page two of the lease, then there would be an upcharge fee. So that tenants can charge the rent, but they would have to pay an additional fee to cover our credit card processing fees. But I can't advertise it that way. I have to give a cash discount, I believe, to be in compliance. Sure, that's the way to... It's like the opposite of a late fee. Of course. Yeah, it's, it's a disguised late fee. Now, it seems to me that it would sound more enticing for a tenant just to pay promptly than to appear on the late fee. Sure. Well, I mean, have you ever done anything like that? Um, no, we just charge them late fees, but I, I have seen that done very often where <laughs> if they paid by the 25th of the month, they could get a discount that they paid on the third of the month, because they have to get a mandatory one-day grace period, then they would be a late fee or something like that. But this has to do more with credit card processing fees and other ways that they might pay outside of the norm. And I know most of us like it that they're paying through a portal, so the money goes in, the money goes out, we never touch it. And we didn't take cash either at our office. Uh, collection services for skipped tenant balances. Of all the things that I did, I feel that I should have done this better or more often. Because when I sold the business, I had over $7 million owed to my owners in collectibles. Because we were sending everything to a collection agency that did all but nothing to really negotiate strong settlements. They would get settlements and I might get some pennies on the dollar, but at the end of the day, I felt that I could have done a better job as a collection company and a skip trace because I was doing it anyway on short-term money owed to me because that's how we would collect rents every month to find where tenants are working and existing. But the balances that are owed to you as a property management company on behalf of owners for people that have skipped in the night, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And I know some of the wealthiest people in my life collect credit card debts and cell phone debts and um, cable bills, little stuff. They send out letters, they get money, and they split it with the cable provider. Another friend of mine, he services mortgages that are not performing, also gets whatever he does by sending a letter. In our industry, very few people really go after it the way it could be done. And, and I feel that 
I have an inside track because I know where the tenant probably is if I did a little bit better skip tracing and I would probably be able to settle these debts. So what I had wished I had done more was said to an owner, if someone skips and we really you know, see that it's lingering, uh, we would like to, the opportunity to go after it and offer you a settlement. Of course it would appear on the credit report. Yes, it would appear on the credit report. The tenant skipped. If I'm a member of the credit bureau, I would report this to the credit bureau. But that's not his motivation. His motivation might be to have a money judgment. His motivation might be able to have this judgment if he ever wants to buy a house. His motivation might be that we're discounting the amount owed in order to settle it in the next seven days, which is how all of these collection agencies work. It's all based on urgency. Anybody ever been to an emergency room and you get a bill? and the bill could be $100 or $1,000, well, that's just the retail price. If you call and you say, I have no insurance, I have no money, what's the cash price? You would be amazed. Right off the bat, they give you 60% off. It's the stupidest system I've ever heard of. I should work for the hospital. They give it away. You just tell me I have no money and you want to pay cash, and I can bring it in this afternoon, but after that I'm going to go buy drugs. So tell me what to do. And, and they, their first off is 40 cents on the dollar because <laughs> that is how the collection industry works in the hospital environment. It should work the same in, in the uh, tenant landlord environment where we want to settle more for cash and get our owners some compensation instead of no compensation. I've spent too long on this, but I've always wanted to do it. So it's a great example, and, and I think that the reasonable tenant would realize that this post-interest example is really causing them so much more money. But I personally, and again, I dealt with the, I wasn't a slumlord, I was a slime lord. Like the lower, no matter how low you think I was, just go one or two more steps below that. And if you don't believe me, just ask Karen Ebert over here. And I, and I would find that when I would kind of have those conversations with people who are chronically owe, owing money, they would just say, oh, sue me and hang up. So it, it, that would work for a certain demographic area of, of a tenant that actually would pay something. Most of the time I was just trying to get the settlement uh, before they bought this afternoon's fix on the street. <laughs> Referral fees from utility companies and credit counseling services, oh God. So I have a cousin who takes tenants and helps them fix their credit so they can see a realtor to buy a house. It's like a whole industry. I mean, many of you are involved with sales, this idea of credit repair, credit counseling. Well, you probably want to have a relationship with these companies because sometimes, you know, you might want to help your tenant find a company that will help them fix their credit. And moving back before that, many times if you are a, a provider of certain utilities like a uh, U-verse or Time Warner Amex or something like that, you could also receive some compensation by having the tenants sign up. When we were in business, we had many utility companies that would pay us, Texas Utilities, that would just pay us like a $50 referral fee if we were to have the tenants sign up online for those utilities. If we were moving in 30 to 60 tenants a month, it was a real revenue source from utilities. And I would, if I was in business again, would look at line extensions to help people with everything from uh, insurance to cell phones to travel, whatever they needed. Tenant occupancy services, TOS. Uh, my youngest daughter, Rose, uh, rented an apartment. And when I was with her, uh, I was amazed that for a fee, they would walk my dog, clean my house, uh, take out the garbage get my dry cleaning. It was like six things. And I said, why couldn't have I done that with my tenants? Walk their dog or maybe just have a relationship with companies like WAG. You need all of these subcontractors more than just fixing toilets and, and fixing air conditioners, but walking dogs, doing dry cleaning, cleaning homes, taking out garbage. There, 
moving. Oh my God. Just make a list of all the businesses that touch your tenant and your owner and figure out how to get relationships with each of these companies because the great apartment communities are doing it and hers was managed by either Gables or Lincoln. They're all these tenant occupancy services. They're just fees. So now that I've kind of laid everything out for you, you need to decide which one and how you're going to do it and who you want to be and perceiving it because as we've already talked about with an 18% add-on for the collection and taking a discount on rent, all of this is a very personal you know, evaluation. What is for one may not be for another. And so I like to go through why do people use your product or services. Now you really want to start to self-promote by developing a brand marketing plan of what makes you so special in this business. Why and what areas are industry hot buttons that you were very good at. You don't have to talk to me or listen to me very long uh, to realize I talk fast and I would always call owners all the time. So my hot button was always response time that I always call people back. And if it was a tough call, I made it my first call. We had a motto in our office, make your worst call your first call, because you're going to have a much better day. So the company was called Get There First, and that was all we did. We would call people back, call people back, even if it's to say the part's on order, we paid for an expedited shipping, and it should be here Tuesday. Instead of calling them on Tuesday and said the part's here, because it gave the, the customer all that time to think you're not doing anything. So that's that was my hot button, was response. Our whole business ran that way. What do I want to be at the end of the day or the end of the career? And I decided I wanted to be Joe Pesci in The Landlord, that, that it was going to be this tough guy that would teach classes to owners who clearly were hurt, were bleeding, were damaged from things that were done to them by tenants, that would give me the property, much like you would hire a hitman to cure problems with an ex. <laughs> that was what I decided to be. I wasn't, I wasn't the glamour property manager. I wasn't doing high rises. My tenants weren't winning architectural design awards. I was a slime lord. And, and I did the lowest level possible. Uh, we had plenty of rentals that were very nice. But most of what I learned and cut my teeth on was the stuff nobody else would manage. $1,000. Which, just so you know, it's now $1,400. Because I sold the business four years ago, and it, it's really $1,400. Like, relative to Austin, that would be $1,600. So I was definitely not in the high end. I was a, a B minus type portfolio. We had plenty of A stuff, too, but it, there's no good stories. No, not at all. No, I, I think the rental rate that I managed was so much less rent by providing incredible services to my customers regardless of who they were or what they paid. It was a lease. I treated 2500 the same as 250 But the perception, the brand, what I did when I would teach a class on landlording at a community college that would get people to sign me up for business was the fact that I would take a bullet when nobody else in the room would. That's all I'm speaking of. So you want to look at who you are and think about what brands you're loyal to in life. And I, I spent my earliest career in packaged goods marketing, so I think like a grocery store. What do you brush with and why? You shave in the morning with what? So far mine is Crest and Procter and Crest and, and um, Gillette because I have Procter and Gamble stock. What firms do you most admire? I most admire Apple Computing. That's my number one ad admiring. I like Amazon, too. Why do you drive a blank? When we were little children, we only drove Volvos because I was convinced the Volvo was the safest car for my kids. It wasn't sporty. It wasn't sexy. It was a box, but it was my tank. My wife used to say we, we drove tanks. That was something we really latched onto. And you think about the phone in your pocket and the loyalties that you have. It's very important. 
but brand and image is everything. This is a joke, that's not one of my rentals, but I do want you to know that this is what we use in, when the city inspector puts this in front of your house, it's, this is a good opportunity to buy a rent property to flip it. That's what you're looking for. Okay, steak versus sizzle. And it's really important that you think about the whole restaurant experience of the steak versus the sizzle. So let's talk about steak. I'm not a big fan. I'm a vegan, so I don't like steak. Literally, in this example, I charge 25% less than XYZ Realty. Don't you hate people that just fight on price? I never would compete on price. Price was the last thing that I needed to fight on. And I would tell owners, go hire them. I'll be here whenever you need me. Go hire them. We'll replace the tenant for free if they skip out on us. Well, what are they disclosing to the owner? That they have skips and that they can replace them for free? How are they gonna pay the Cobro Commission? So again, these are things that I find to be cheap shots to get business. We pay three months free management fee for referrals. I never paid a referral fee to my owners, but I sent them market newsletters every quarter. I went to their funerals. I went to their weddings. I was their guy. I didn't need to pay them. That would be the dirtiest money in the world to compensate my owners. But they would talk about me in church and in synagogue and at the, the VFW hall because I was going to take that bullet. So that again, just that stake. ABC charges what? I'll match it. Stop competing with money and start competing with sizzle. Every one of you has a special aspect of your ability in this room to be a property manager, to be a mom, to be a student, to be a husband. You need to focus on what you are magically great at. So let's look at sizzle. Our average length of occupancy is 27 months, which is 15% higher than the industry, reducing your turnover and the lease commissions you paid. Now that's a long sentence, but just think about it. If I wanted to hire, if I wanted to hire Daniel who charges me X and Rick who charges me X plus 10%, but Rick is selling me on the fact that he takes such good care of his customers that his occupancy is longer making up and even exceeding the 10% he charges more than the other property manager, I'm gonna give him the business because it's not what you get, it's what you net. And focus your clients on the net and this was one of the most compelling things that we took such good care of our customers, our tenants, by making repairs very quickly, by being so diligent about explaining the lease. Many of you use the TAR lease. I was on a video, still am on the video on YouTube. I went through every paragraph of that lease like it was the Bible. And I, if a tenant came in stoned, I would not let them do the closing. I really stopped people because I realized they were not in the capacity to understand what I was saying. And this was the most important contract they signed. And they didn't understand why. And then I'd show them pictures of set outs, show them pictures of what happens to tenants who don't listen and tell them that they can walk out right now and I'll give them all their money back because I don't want them to do this lease unless they understand it. It's like a marriage contract where you're not listening to the person doing the ceremony while they're going over your vows. To me, that's what a lease is. So I made it very important that our customer, our tenant, was educated. And once they understood how to make maintenance requests and stuff like that, they would stay with us longer. This was a really good item to sell owners. Occupancy length, because that to an owner is the most money they saved. We figured out that every time a tenant had to move out of a property for an owner, it cost the owner three months of rent. Three months, between time empty, lease fees, and make ready. If Rick is able to save that, of course I'd be willing to pay him a higher management fee because his tenants stay longer. I don't even need to figure out why. He has white hair, he must know what he's doing. <laughs> Our average tenant has a credit score of blank. He has hair, that's right, has hair. Our tenant has an average credit score of blank. Does this number really mean anything to an owner? I don't know, but compare it to what the average credit score might be and you begin to show that your portfolio quality of the tenant is much higher, perhaps, than what an owner might be subject to elsewhere. Every vendor we use must pass a credit and criminal background check 
and leave written notification, the door hanger, whenever they enter the customer's home. This is just smart business, that if a tenant is going to have a repair done, that we want them to know before they walk in the door that someone had been in their house or that someone is in their house. Nothing more dangerous than the tenant who is armed comes home and just kind of misses the fact that there's someone in the house making a repair. So the vendor would also leave a sign on the outside of the door that they're in the house. So these are the types of things that would make tenants feel comfortable that we really are using better quality vendors and not just some stranger on the street that's going to have a key to their house. I never had a problem with a vendor. I never had a problem where a tenant said something was missing. The vendors were by far the best behaved group of all four that I dealt with, employees, tenants, owners. The vendors really wanted to do a good job. Our broker, oh, this is amazing. Our broker is a CPA or a licensed contractor or ex-military or a, a broker or an MPM or has a certification with the Austin Association, Austin Board of Realtors. I mean, you guys possess very special credentials. Anybody here a veteran? You can lift it proudly because I want to give business to vets. Vets love vets. Even non-vets like vets. Being a veteran is a very powerful thing in property management because they realize that you had some portion of your life that was involved with structure, order, duty, honor. Who wouldn't want that in their side? You know, it's amazing. Or a CPA. How many of you own rental property? This is a very compelling part of the empathy relationship when pitching owners. The fact that you are to an investor and you would understand many of the concerns they have and here's why. And you start talking about what you've done to overcome those obstacles, why you started your management company. Many of you often started because you couldn't find anybody that was good to manage your property. So you started managing them yourself and you went into business. There are stories that each one of you have. I want you to really think about what is your personal journey embellish it, whatever you need, and use some of your qualifications. Uh, those initials after your name are extremely valuable when explained to a potential client. Uh, when there was uh, two C certified residential management companies in the state of Texas, the Ebert's company and my company, only two in the state, this is many years ago, and owners would be shopping, I used to say, just promise me one thing, you will hire only a company that's certified a certified residential or management company. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure you write it down. C-R-M-C. Please. You, this is like the most important thing. It's like being a CPA. Well, unless they were going to Austin to hire the management company, I was guaranteed the business because there was only two of us in the state. So you have to out-compete with things that are sizzling, that are things that are, are real but can't be beaten down. Military, CPA, former investor, initials after your name, um, I don't know, just, I don't know each one of you, but I could certainly tell you that I spent a lot of time selling things that were not stake related, that had nothing to do with my fees. ABC charges what? Well, I'll be here whenever you need us, and I will do my very best. Owners would be amazed when I would so quickly not negotiate, because the fee was just such a, a meaningless number if we're talking about a point or two, because if the other company didn't commit to the marketing program that we committed to to reduce time empty, it was just, it was ridiculous how much more money they would lose saving one or two points or whatever it is. So I just empower you to stop fighting against each other with fees that each of you charges, because it doesn't matter. The market makes whatever the fee can support, but you also make a lot of this support. Try use words when you speak to owners like your and my. Personalize it. Very important that when I talk to an owner, it was really, you know, your property and, you know, my experience. It was very one-on-one. -on -one. Owners always felt like there was a very personal relationship because you cannot put a value on relationships. And I found the single most successful thing I ever did to maintain relationships was I wrote a newsletter every quarter about the market, about trends in the marketplace. And I'd send it to every owner. And they really said, you know, 
I would only want to be able to talk to the guy who wrote the newsletter, big deal, you know, so they would talk to me. So these are just examples of marketing that sells things you can't put a price on. This is from the company Symantec that makes many products, including Norton Antivirus and ACT. And the message is saying, like, while you were out, hackers tried to break in. Well, how could you not pay for a service, this is an old ad, that would help Norton Antivirus from people to take your personal data or to hack your computer? So everybody was buying Norton Antivirus because of the fact that it didn't matter what it cost. And let's say another antivirus program was cheaper, but that word Norton really had some brand connection to pay a premium for. This is money management. Money management, and the line says, there's always a bull market for integrity, the Bank of New York. Um, I find money management to be the most fascinating thing in the world, and you will too. If you ever retire, it's all you got. You can't screw it up. Uh, but it becomes much less about fee and much more about relationship. And that's what this ad is, much like property management. This is my favorite. If this worked for Volvo, it certainly is going to work for Ford. These are all examples of safety, occupant sensors, and obviously airbags, and wheel locks, uh, excuse me, wheel brakes, uh, and 12 things that tell you when something's broken. Like, this is a minivan. Who sits in minivans? Your children and your grandchildren. So you would want to have this minivan. This is sizzle marketing. This has nothing to do with the fact that it's $6,000 cheaper than the Honda Odyssey. That's not what these ads talk about. They are competing on a level other than price, and that's what I empower each of you here today to do with your life as a property manager. A fee-based service business is to try to sell things people cannot put a price on. It's much easier. We had a motto to our customers, to our potential tenants, to please pick your landlord before you pick your property. And we would go through a list of things, of services that we offer tenants. You know, free CDs of your move-in inspection, because how often is the single argument, the first argument is, it was like that when I moved in. We would really want the tenant to have a video, and now obviously we could upload it to the cloud. But we would empower the tenant to not lose any of their security deposit because we would want them to have the move-in condition. I mean, I'm not going to query the room, but it always bothered me that property managers would give a blank move-in condition inspection, leave it on the counter and say, there's a blank paper in there, just fill it out and return it within five days of any defects you see. And the tenants would never fill it out, and then you would say, well, you didn't return it, so we assumed it was perfect. That's, to me, not nice to a customer who is probably not going to turn it in. We would do the move-in condition form. We would take the pictures. We would give the package to the tenant. We didn't want there to be any argument when they moved out because that's, that's a waste of time to argue over move-out condition. Did you, are you saying that you filled it out with the No, I didn't say. The word with was never in that sentence. <laughs> with is not part of this presentation. For the tenant. And we said, if you have any edits of things we mix, miss, turn that in within five days. 95% never did, but we had, we felt a much better footing with the tenant, and obviously there were pictures as well. I'll get to, yeah? Did you tell them about moving No. <laughs> now you're making fun of me. No, it's part, the tenant should get a moving condition for me. No, we, I have to say that, um, I wouldn't try, yes, I'm sure there are. No, we want, we wanted the tenant to know how torn up. Um, yeah, you could have them sign it or it could say in the lease that you were, you were given a moving condition form upon moving and you have five days to return it. If not, then you are agreeing that it's deemed to be accurate. No, we would never have them sign it. Uh, we would never see them again to sign it. We were moving our office too often. They never knew where we were. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else? Okay, just don't argue over security deposits. It is a stupid argument to have. It is a waste of time. I mean, I've, I've had just so little experience in this area because I loved to take pictures. We would have a thousand pictures on a property. We would have virtual tours done. We had everything in the cloud. The tenant could access it. There was no problem. We would put it up on two big screens if the tenant wanted to really see what we were being deducted for, comparing A to B. They couldn't say it was like that when I moved in. And, and it was just a much easier way to live life, not going to court over security deposit. Uh, objections. 
And this is another uh, flyer that was put out by Remax that I picked out, and it just kind of went over landlord tenant IQ, and it would be given to investors. So they ran the list within the tax records of folks who don't receive the tax bill in the same zip code as the property. And it would then pop up those that have different zip codes, and then they would just highlight the address, mostly out-of-town owners, and send them this flyer that just talked about, um, if you own rental property, you need a copy of the Landlord and Tenant's Guide, which was uh, the attorney Judson Fumbro put out by the Texas Real Estate Commission and the Texas A&M University. You know that big, thick book? I used to love that book. It's written really easy to read. But it would just go through all of the rights that both tenants and landlords have. This flyer, like so many aspects of what we do, just scares landlords, that they realize there's a lot more to this than if I think I'm going to self-manage rentals, which I would just be amazed with. Amazed with. I, I couldn't self-manage rentals. I always would want a property management company. So brand marketing is powerful. You try to get a face-to-face -face with the client in your office. I, I like doing that. We liked doing property inspections when we took over properties without the owner there because they would just give us the tour and it would be an extra hour than we needed. And we were very cognizant of how much time we spent doing these new property inspections. But to have an owner come to our office was great. They got to see all the framed awards on the wall. They got to see all the people involved with the business. Um, and it was a very compelling function in our office. They, they really realized they were in the center of the universe. Use endorsement marketing to build credibility. Uh, I don't think there's any question that you get complimented very often by your clients and your customers. People thank you. Sometimes owners will say, I can't believe you got that done. That was so nice. Please remember to then say, could you do me a favor? I'm trying to build my business. And it would be so helpful to have a letter of endorsement from you saying that you're happy with our work. Owners would love to be part of your growth. I mean, I, I had at least 50 letters that I would use because I would always ask, it was just natural for me when someone would compliment me, I would ask them to send me a letter of recommendation. And I had some great letters of recommendation. My favorite ones were from realtors and lawyers. Two areas that you would never think would let you manage a property, almost like a doctor thanking a doctor, especially the realtor letters. Realtors who said, I sell real estate for a living, I never realized how much uh, you know, more money could be made if it was being professionally managed and just having a real estate license doesn't mean that you could do everything. And those were just great letters because I did market a lot to realtors who often were investors and lawyers who were often investors. Don't discount. One of the things I also learned from this gentleman, Dave Holt, was to offer money back guarantees. Sometimes that's the difference for like the exercise equipment you see on channel 463 look like this in three hours or less, money back guarantee if it doesn't work. I always forget to return the stuff. I have so many things in my house that have a money back guarantee, I threw the box away. So using a money back guarantee on property management, especially if we were at that point where we have two property managers in the room that are so close on price, but there's just something about this guy that sounds like he's more experienced and he, he has a lo longer retention rate that he focused on that really would make me more money. And then Mr. Ebert says, and here's something else. We have a money back guarantee on our services. If you don't like anything about our services, first three months we give you back all your money. You can terminate at any time. I mean, I don't know about the terminate at any time, but I never had anybody ask for their money back. Never. Because, you know, you do whatever you need to do in your normal course of business. You do a good job for most people. Love the money back guarantee, just like exercise equipment on TV. Innovation is an easy brand attribute to sell. So I talked about having those pictures in the cloud so the tenants and the owners can always see the condition. That's cool. Everybody has access to that. One of the things that we live through that I'm sure everybody does now is for tenants to be able to pay from their telephone, right, so that they can get to the portal to make rent payments. And many of our tenants... Um, they didn't work conventionally with, with money. They were in cash businesses. So they would be able to pay at 7-Eleven, Dollar General. You know, there was something called pay, pay lease and uh, paynearme.com. I still use them on some notes I have. But many of my tenants still do not trust banks, and or my tenants that I did have. And we used all of these third-party places they could go to, retail establishments that would take the rent 
and then uh, process it right to us. That was really innovative. And you talk to owners who were always having to meet tenants at a bus stop to get paid rent, and we said, oh no, we have a, a great agreement with 7-Elevens that tenants could pay at any 7-Eleven. And those are things that just blow owners away, thinking, wow, they have state-of-the-art technology if they're able to pay at 7-Eleven. Anybody use any real cool ways to pay rent? Anybody, tenants could pay with their phones? And can anybody pay in the office? Yeah, I would love a swipe thing at the office, like credit card. Uh, send handwritten thank you notes to owners and tenants. I realize we live in the world of email, but I am old school when it comes to thanking people. And I think it's very special if your clients open the mail to send a handwritten thank you note. All of you should get stationery that has your name, and you should try to write one thank you note a week. And if that starts to work for you, try writing two. You have absolutely no idea how much business I would receive when I knew there were multiple property managers interviewing with that owner, and I would be back at the office, thank you note written, I'd go to the post office so they had it the next day. I'm sure I was the only property manager they interviewed that day that they received a handwritten thank you note from the next day. And you know what that says to them? He's really good at follow-up. He's really good. I didn't, I didn't say tenant, I said owners. Uh, oh, you want to thank tenants too? Sure, we can thank a tenant. You can thank a tenant for renewing their lease. We would do that very often. Of course we would thank tenants for moving in, for renewing their lease, yeah. Yeah, but owners were really, um, you know, I used to have this stack of potential owners that I would send packages to. So every day I had three or four owners. I called them every day. We would travel all over the world and I would still call them every day. They'd see that I'm like overseas, and, and, and I would call them every day. And I finally get through the owner, I'd say, I'm just following up on a package we sent about managing your property. And they would say, you are the most persistent person I have ever met. And you know what I said? Here's one of those things you would say the same thing every time. Just wait till you see what I do when someone owes you money. <laughs> Always got the business. I had some of these home run lines. Tenants would call me and they'd say, well, I'm looking to rent the property that you have, but there's another one down the street that I've left messages for for a few days waiting to hear back. Here's another home run line. If you're waiting that long for them to call you back to give them money, just think how long you're going to have to wait for them to call you back when you want them to spend money. Got the lease every time. Ka-ching. You need to focus on what it is in your brand, in your powerful image that you're good at. Ours was follow-up. And we, and we really did try to leverage that. Write a personal quarterly newsletter, mail it, email it. This was my favorite thing to do. And all I did, you read the Austin American Statesman, you cut out the articles that have to do with real estate trends and statistics. You look at the Wall Street Journal. I mean, I would just cut out newspapers, put it in a folder, and every 90 days I'd open the folder, I would write a column about the stock market, because I know that was the alternative investment most of my clients were, were doing instead of rental property investment. And then I'd write about the marketplace, and I would write about innovations in our office, and I'd write about um, things we, we would recommend owners do in terms of improvements. And you control the message, because you're the only messenger. And this was a newsletter they looked forward to getting. It was almost like... Um, what you might get from your stockbroker or something like that. Did it for years. I loved it. Loved it. Loved to write newsletters. Talk about your professional designations. Many of you can here at the um, Austin Board of Realtors receive some certifications for property management. We have those available, and I think you should commit yourself to getting some professional designations in the area of property management. Joining the National Association of Property Managers that I know many of you in this room through offers many professional designations. That sets you apart. Very small percentages of property managers have designations. And I know realtors who sell do it, realtors or real estate professionals who do property management, we should do it too. And you learn a lot in class. Your personal story, as I've tried to build this through today, is really your brand history. And the story that you want to tell needs to be unique and compelling powerful and comfortable so that you can capture more business by not having to fight over fees. And you could always scare them with City of Austin horror stories. And this is real. 
because I know that Austin had many more rules than Dallas, and right now Dallas has too many rules. So when you look at an owner with regard to property inspections that may be required by the city, um, juggling Section 8 paperwork, which we embraced and loved, and though it was a very defective program, we loved the tenants on it because they should be deservant of, of housing, but the, the paperwork was very hard, but we would do it. We used to do it. So I think you need to make sure that people know how hard it is to comply with the city of Austin and even the state of Texas. How many of you inspect properties that don't have a, a keyless deadbolt on the door? I mean, that law is only 26 years old. That was when George Bush the first was president. It came in. I mean, it's so ridiculous how far off um, owners are on even knowing they need keyless deadbolts, smoke detectors, locking devices of a certain kind on sliding glass doors. And I would just like ramble with this stuff so the owner like felt like he had just gone to the doctor, had a physical, and he's going to die tomorrow unless he joins a health club. I was the health club. The most, <laughs> good, getting some laughs. All right, two most powerful words to overcome problems are, I'm sorry. I can't tell you how many times I would apologize during the course of a day because very often owners just want to hear those words, as do your customer tenants. I'm sorry. You have to be willing to apologize and move on. Get back to getting the vendor out there or fixing whatever the problem was. But I saved more business in my life with those two words than, than portfolios that some of you have because owners would be ready to fire us and I would just walk in there and I would just be just ready to do it and I would just apologize. I, I think I'm sorry is the most two underused words in the service industry. Sometimes I just want to hear that. And I know a lot of, uh, like UVerse does it a lot because I'm always aggravated and they always say I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> so they're stealing my thunder. And five most powerful words to end a call with is thank you for your business. I've had the same stockbroker for 25 years. We have uh, lunch every quarter. And it, it seems corny, but the last words that he ever says, and he's a rancher, you know, really good old Texas guy, and he shakes my hand and he always says, Mark, thank you for your business. And I thought about that. He, he did that over and over again. It was just part of his culture to thank people. But you need to be thanking your owners and thank your tenants and thank your vendors and thank your employees. Thank people for their business, especially your owners. Owners don't expect to be thanked for their business. Well, I shouldn't say that. Owners really appreciate being thanked for their business. I don't know what owners expect, but I'm going to give it to them either way. I'm going to constantly thank them. And these five words, thank you for your business, went a long way. That's it. That says everything I want to say. Thank you for your business. I mean, your business might be driving me crazy. Your business might be ridiculous. But, but thank you for your business. Thank you for giving me the business. <laughs> All right. So who do you service? We're going to talk a little bit about the generational conflicts. Traditionalists, these are your World War II vets born before 1946. These are people like my late father. They're loyal, they're patriotic, they're conservative. They usually have a faith-based connection to God. Then we have people like myself, baby boomers, boomers, boomers. We question things. We want rights. We live through Vietnam and Watergate. And most of your clients are probably not traditionalists because the average traditionalist now is close to 80 years old. And then Gen X, uh, you have clients, I'm sure, who are Gen X. They are the most skeptical generation and least trusting. They live through AIDS, crack, MTV. Um, I, would, I, would, I would think that... My business was successful because I got to really market to traditionalists and baby boomers. When I got into these next groups, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, these millennials, which God bless you all, 82 to 2000, they're globally concerned. So perhaps having a green aspect of your business would be very compelling that we offer free recycling or we don't use paper. I mean, th these are things that really are hot buttons for millennials. Remember, I started this by saying don't sell like you buy. You know, I use a lot of paper. I print a lot of things. But I would, if I was dealing with someone who believed in green, I would tell them about all of our recycling. The globally concerned, they're, they're, they're very literate with uh, the cell phones. Collaborative, non-polluting. Many grew up watching parents uh, get foreclosed on. That's very important. They're very, very uh, skeptical, skeptical about real estate, and therefore they remain tenants much longer than we ever believed, paying much higher rent than we ever thought possible.
possible. This is the trend because they watched their parents get foreclosed on. Real estate wasn't the end all. It will be again, don't worry. Love to use Yelp, so be careful what you say and do. Or use a different name. Uh, <laughs> they used to say to me, your name really creditor? No, that's just what they give us in the business. It's, it's just a, it's a business, I'm creditor, you know, with a C. So the, the point I'm trying to make is your employees who could be millennials are having to deal with uh, an elderly client who's a traditionalist. And this is a true story. I had lunch with uh, my right hand um, person who was a millennial. He really was phenomenal for me because he just, we complimented each other because everything that he did I thought was ridiculous and everything I insisted on he thought was ridiculous. We got along great. But we had a client, he was 96 years old. He's actually 99 now because I had lunch yesterday with the boys. And he used to say that he's having trouble, he would tell this to the millennial, having trouble understanding the rents, you know, coming in on the duplex. And my millennial, the smartest kid, you know, I might ever meet in my life, says to him, well, just pull it up on the owner portal and you'll be able to figure it out. You can even use the app we have now for the cell phone. And I'm listening to him tell a 99-year-old man to pull it up on the portal. I said, he's our client. Don't sell like you buy. Send him the statement. In fact, why don't you bring it to him at lunch? You know, it's like he's, you can't have expected. And he said to me, well, if he can't do it our way, then maybe he doesn't need to be a client of ours. And he really meant, he, he didn't, he meant this in the way that you need to get on with the fact that, you know, this is the future, wherever my phone is, one of these pockets. So the future is really this, this whole device that everybody is going to be living through. Well, I wasn't about to lose this client's business, so I insisted that we printed the statements and mailed it to him. I would do that for lots of my traditionalists. First ones to read the, to, to send a letter of recommendation. Most of my letters of recommendation were for people 80 and above. First ones to talk you up at, at church or VFW or synagogue or wherever it is they're socializing. They're the best, most loyal clients you'd ever want. I'm saying don't sell like you buy. Figure out what you need to do to sell to each generation so that you can take in as much business as possible. And again, staying within the confines of of normal life. I mean, clearly we still process the tenant's rent through the portal and we put it in his bank account through the portal and we get his son involved sometimes, but I never would say no to business because they didn't fit in the box. In your opinion, do you feel like um, in this day and age with the millennials, it's like they, you don't need a physical office for the property management, everything's done virtually, you know, online? I think it would be great not to have a physical office if you're dealing with everything online. All that I care about is the level of service I'm able to provide. And, and I, I agree with you. I, I think in the end, I didn't really see much pe many people coming to our office physically. Though we had a drop slot that was an electric mailbox. If the traditionalist wanted to come, he was in a nursing home and he couldn't walk. I didn't think he was going anywhere. <laughs> but he was the example I use about this generation. Okay. Um, yeah, there's jokes about millennials, and, and these are my millennials. This is Tal Morrison, who was in uh, Hawaii on December 7, 1941, as a 20-year-old uh, uh, Navy sailor, and was at Sunday morning church service when the bombs dropped at Pearl Harbor, and he was told by the minister to jump the ship. He was praying, and the minister said, jump the ship. And he jumped off the ship, and his life was saved, but for his whole life, he always felt extremely guilty that he should have been down there with his other sailors on the USS Oklahoma. I was a marathon runner for most of my life, and Tal and I would run together, and he would spend times telling me stories about really what it was to be a traditionalist and the values that he grew up with. This was Brooks. He was one of my property managers, and he was in Vietnam also a veteran. I learned a lot in, of lessons in life from veterans. And, and he was skeptical and he was rebellious and he would fight so hard for people's rights in the office and our tenants and our owners. And, and, and like, again, different generation, but you have to be able as an employer to have relationships with different generations and as a person involved with customer service. Um, quite fond of those guys. So what are you best at? Making repairs fast for good prices, that was kind of what we were really good at is just responding. Collecting late fees and chargebacks goes with number one. We were real good at compliance, posting people 
in the old days on the second of the month with a one day notice to vacate and then we filed on the fourth. Then they changed the law that we had to give a mandatory one day grace period. So we would go to everybody on the third with a one day notice and then file on the fifth. But we did everything like a machine, keeping occupancy levels high. This to me is the most value you could offer an owner is to really latch on to statistics that have to do with that. Finding investors to buy your clients rentals. This is another important relationship that you have and finding these investors to buy rentals uh, can be found with even third party services like home investors or others that you should have relationships with so that you can at least have outlets for your owners when they need to sell. Finding rentals to sell clients more doors so that you're able to build portfolios for your owners when they want to have good experiences repeated over and over and over again. Systematic inspections and reporting, whether it's done by third party vendors or your own internal team, but you must be able to track and load up to the cloud physical inventory inspections of your properties. It's the least you can do. Tenant education on caring for homes. Those newsletters I sent to the owners, I also sent ones to the tenants about changing air conditioning filters and covering exterior um, faucets. I mean, anything that have been problems for tenants, having renter's insurance, uh, watering the foundation. I mean, I, I was all about making sure the tenant wasn't going to step in it by, by breaking something they didn't mean to break because they didn't know. Complying with Texas rules and laws. There's no bigger commitment that I enjoyed more than uh, being involved with the Real Estate Commission, writing contracts for all of you uh, realtors in this um, wonderful state we live in and being involved with NARPM. I, I really, I really loved uh, the, le the lease we have here in Texas. And I, and I feel that every one of us should look at that almost like Bible passage and know what every paragraph talks about so you can immediately get your tenant to see where it says that they were supposed to give notice on or before the first. That's paragraph three. So the normal business that we've been talking about is not inside this box because no matter where you want to think you're normal, we are abnormal because we deal with tenants and owners and vendors and employees often that fall outside the box. If this was just a box business where everybody paid on time and there was no repairs, everybody would do it. So I say to you that look at some of these other areas and assign the time value of what it's taking to service them. Whether it be these homeowners association violations or the excess security deposit cash balances or late fees or NSF fees or eviction protection fees. Do it well, do it often and don't lose money because you have to do it. That create these businesses within your business that naturally exist that you're going to probably be dealing with anyway. You're going to have to go to court. You're going to have to pay for parking. You're going to have to lose a half a day and also probably pay a toll. So you should probably have in paragraph 26 of your lease, which I think is special provisions, some aspect of, of what needs to be done. What's the hardest paragraph of the lease to explain is paragraph 18 repairs. To explain to a tenant the four things we fix in Texas is just crazy. You know, heat, air conditioning, hot water to 120 degrees and structural defects, closing water penetration. So you want to look at how long you have in life. And unfortunately, the industry is moving away from mom and pop property management companies and through a lot of conglomerates, uh, large companies that buy portfolios like ours, uh, the business is becoming different. But mom and pops will always have a place in the American industry and the unique services that you provide as a mom or pop um, is still very important to owners very important to owners, especially if you live and, and operate within the same community as their rentals. But the goal is the same whether it's a large company or a small company, and that's to be big enough to serve you, yet small enough to know you. Many synagogues and churches use this as a theme for membership. Well, I took it right to our business. I knew every owner by their property, by their name. It was just a game like I wanted to know and if I ever visited the property I usually remembered the property. I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning but I always remember a floor plan. I immediately asked the Eberts about their home and about their their, their office because I just remember real estate because I love real estate. So big enough to know you, small enough 
big enough to serve you, small enough to know you. Treat every door as if it's our only one and just stop yelling and start selling. And my story is that a guy hires me to manage some properties, three houses, and I said, when I was new to business, we don't work that area. We don't work that area because it was kind of a, a lower income area that I really had no idea about. And I passed. And he hired the next property manager who took those three and got seven others in a really nice area. So it was just bait. And I often found that I built my portfolio by taking the first property that maybe nobody else would want, showing an owner that I can make miracles happen with this, and then they would give me the other rentals that were better. So don't, don't shy away and make too many rules. I don't manage properties less than that amount. I don't manage that area. Like, just be everything to all people and do it all well. Seamless process so that paperwork doesn't have to have paper, so that you're able to service both traditionalists or baby boomers with the paper, but the millennials with the on-phone app. You need to be all things to all people. Often our brand motivation is fear, and this is what I often did at community colleges. I would tell stories to owners, I would scare them, I would really go out of my way to scare them about all the laws in Texas they had to comply with, and then I would take them on a tour of my day. And my day would start by having to do a property inspection. This is 4524 Amesbury, apartment C. It's a condominium that I bought in 1986 for $7,000. And I uh, never heard from the tenant for about 20 years. He was, he would, his sister paid the rent two months at a time, and I raised the rent every year by 10 or $20. It was the best, best rental I ever owned. All the others were terrible stories, terrible stories. But then the neighbor downstairs said, uh, my ceiling smells like beer. I said, okay, maybe I should go see it, because I had a rule. I never would go see my properties that I owned. Never would see them. It was bad luck. So I went to go look at the inspection. And um, he obviously didn't clean up well. And uh, it still is the best rental I ever had. I wish I had 100 properties that looked like this because of the fact that I didn't have to go there for 20 years, raise the rent every year. That's the media room, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and why is there a doggy dog on the refrigerator I never could figure out? <laughs> this is the bathroom. He was clean shaven. I'm glad I have that, that Gillette foamy there. <laughs> And oh, this is good. You know how often the, the, the uh, condensate leaks above the, uh, you know, the unit is leaking, but he never called to have it blown out, so the whole air conditioner fell into the tub. <laughs> that was, um, that's the top of the air conditioner. Um, and then you know, the owner asked for an inspection, and I called, you know, like this is the owner. This is what an owner looks like when he's shown those pictures. And I would show these pictures and teach at community colleges these investor classes, and you can do this. And you just empower owners to the glass that's half empty. I don't need to tell them about the glass half full. They believed that when they went to the seminar and bought the property. I'm about the glass half empty. The worst case scenario of what will happen likely if you're doing this long enough. And I used to send refrigerator magnets every holiday season because I wanted to be the magnet on the door when the husband or wife slams the door and says, I can't believe the tenant did that again. And there's my name right there. And so we do a lot of marketing. We throw a lot of directional uh, signs all over town, uh, getting people to our rentals. Um, one of the things that wasn't included in my introduction is the fact that uh, I love music and I teach music classes my whole life. I uh, played piano when I was a kid and still do. Uh, but there's a song that was written in 1850, usually there's a piano at these classes, um, that was a Civil War song that has to do with um, uh, Love Me Tender. So if you all want to sing with me, this is fun if it works. So this is called Love Me Renter, and then I'll take final questions and we can go have lunch. Everybody go. Love me, renter, I'm the one. You write your rent check to. It better be here by the third or I'll come after you love me 
don't mess around with me. Oh, love me, renter, I'm the one that won't return your call. When your toilet, it overflowed and burns in the hall. Everybody, let's end it big now. Love me, renter, love me true, or you'll get me pissed. Believe me, there are more like you on my waiting list. Uh. Everything I do is just for fun. Those, uh, those opportunities to laugh really are the way that we make it through the day. I find there's challenges in everything we do. You are all heroes in my eyes for everything that you do every day. I hope that, is there any final questions? Anybody have anything? Thank you, yes sir. Good, thank you all so much. Yes, sir. To me, it's designed so that our owner doesn't lose any money. So it's not income for the owner, it's really a hedge your bet for the owner. And uh, we never did early termination fees, but at lunch yesterday, they told me they're now doing it because the market's so strong that they did, we always just put it upon the tenant. The tenant would call and they'd say, well, I need to move, and I'd say, we need to find a replacement for your, for your property, which I think is in the paragraph 28 of the lease. And uh, the tenants would then seek a replacement that was as qualified or more qualified than them, which is what the lease says, and we would charge them a fee to do the paperwork. The other paragraph says if the tenant wants you to find the, the person, they could hire you to do it. And all that seems to be just too much work. And many companies have gone to just early termination fees, an early termination of a certain number of months of rent so the tenants can just leave. My daughter has it in her lease in the apartment. I think it's two months, but I'm not setting what it should be. It's the market that will determine it. But it just seems to be the trend because our markets are very strong so that tenants can buy houses and move along. Yes, ma'am. Um, is there a violation that the tenant would pay for a homeowner's association violation, especially if the homeowner's association is making me get in my car, drive over there, take a picture, send it to them, fill out paperwork. I mean, it's, it's, the, the homeowner's associations are so tough on the property manager. Many of them have divisions that do property management, so I think they're just trying to wear you out. That I just realized that if the tenant has a list that says don't park here, and they park there, and then the HOA is given a violation, then there should be a small fee for me because I got to go collect the violation. Like yeah, I would. <laughs> Outside the box. Yes. Yes, an addendum that says if you incur an HOA fee, there'll be a value added for our time to collect it. Yes. Again, if you want to share late fees with your owners, that's just a business practice. We always did because it was a, a pretty uh, likely scenario. The owner would be more patient with the customer before saying file an eviction if they knew they were getting a few bucks extra. We did it more for the tenant than for the owner. Anything else? Yes, sir. Well, uh, I think it's easier to make it all part of your management agreement. I care about disclosures most to the client so that they knew what things we would be receiving referral fees from. And I do believe that most brokerage referral fees require us to transact through licensing. Uh, most owners have no problem with. 
It's the other ones that you have to be a little bit more specific how they work. Good, I'll stay after if anybody has any personal questions. And again, have a wonderful day and thank you.